is our third. This is our third environment for the American Info session. And today we have three uh, National Park Service and Forest Service supervisors that we've worked with in the past or are working with right now. Uh, and they've been absolutely great. We'll introduce our staff and we'll introduce our programs briefly for those of you that haven't joined us before. Um, so you can get a little bit about each program. And then we'll go into the presentations uh, with these wonderful supervisors. Uh, ground rules, please mute your microphones uh, while we're doing the presentations. We will have a Q&A session at the end of all the presentations, but if you want to go ahead and type in uh, questions in the chat box as we go, feel free to do that. And if you're able to turn your camera on, we'd love to see your faces. Great, thank you, Andrea. And so I'm the, I'm the tech team out here and we're gonna take the presentation live on Facebook, uh, but we'll turn it off when we get to the section on, uh, or give you an option to open up your mics and ask questions personally. So let me see where that, going and my chat has disappeared so if you can just let me know sue when we're ready to go actually i just tried and it didn't work it didn't give me the option to go live on facebook so hang on let me see if it's going to work if not it's there we go okay So I'll ask everyone to be quiet for about 10 seconds while it prepares. And you're live. Hi everyone, thanks again for being here. Meet the Environment for the Americas Internships Program team. My name is Andrea Garcia and I'm the Latino Heritage Internship program lead and the resource assistant uh, program coordinator. And Daniela Garcia is our Latino Heritage Internship Program Manager. Hi everyone, I'm Sheila Diaz Mendez and I am the Mosaics Program Manager. And I also work with Chanel and she is the Mosaics and Science Program Lead. Hello everyone, my name is Alberto Vialbando and I am program manager for our newest program, Fish and Feathers. And we also have, oh, I'm sorry, to you, who's our uh, Environment for the American graphic designer, one of the best graphic designers you'll ever find. So Mosaics and in Science internship program is the, sorry, the internship program designed for diverse students. And this means that we encourage everyone to apply, but we really want to give an opportunity to underrepresented youth. So uh, any student, undergraduate or graduate student can apply to these positions. You'll find them at the Environment for the Americas webpage. The stipends range from $600 to $640 a week. And these internship programs will be a, have a duration of 12 weeks up to 20 weeks. You can find that information in the webpage too. They start on May, mid-May, and they typically end in August, but with extensions of the 20 weeks, it could be in, it could go into October. So this year we have 24 wonderful and exciting positions. Please check them out. The Latino Heritage Internship Program is designed to provide internship opportunities uh, at national parks to young adults who identify as Latino. So again, everybody's welcome to apply, but it does focus on Latino and Latino heritage. And we have uh, different positions. So there's natural resource management, uh, visitor education, um, and all sorts of, of different positions. So there is quite a bit of variety. And these positions are 11 to 12 weeks. Uh, 600 to 640 dollars stipend a week and uh, just like uh, Shadla said these will start in May, May 15th and typically they go until August 5th. Uh, on some of them the dates might change but that's your typical time frame and this uh, for this coming year we have 33 positions. We have other internship opportunities environment for the Americas 
One of those is the resource assistant program wrap. So this one ranges from six months to 12 months, and sometimes there's in between like eight months. Uh, also very uh, various positions. So right now we have some law enforcement ones, we've had hydrology, uh, finance, so it really varies and there's a lot of opportunities for, for different people. And we've got a cohort at Golden Gate right now. So that's where the National Park Service Resource Assistant Program is with the Forest Service. We also work with Fish and Wildlife. And we have a new program, Fish and Feathers, if you want to go ahead and take that out. Sure. So uh, this is Fish and Feathers, Connecting Parks and Communities. Uh, it's our newest program funded by the National Park Service and administered by us, Environment for the Americas. Uh, our goal is to provide uh, national parks with talented interns who are eager to learn and engage with the local communities. Our overall goal is to increase uh, diverse community engagement with our park partners and to uh, engage ethnically and racially diverse young professionals in natural resource careers. But obviously it is open to all. We currently have uh, nine, about nine positions available on our website with more to come. So our info sessions, we've done three. This is our third one. Uh, our next one will be January 18th. We will have a second, a day in the life of an, of an EFTA intern. So if you were here for the December 14th, there, we will have a different interns. So if you still feel like you want to go ahead and, and listen to some different interns and their experiences, we definitely encourage you to come on January 18th. And then our final one will be January 25th, a virtual tour of internship sites. So we'd love to see you there. We would love to see your application soon. If you are uh, interested in the Mosaics program, you can go ahead and apply at mosaicsandscience.org. If you're interested in the Latino Heritage Internship Program, you can apply at latinoheritageintern.org. If you're interested in the RAP program, the Resource Assistant Program, uh, the Fish and Feathers Program, or you want to go ahead and apply for different programs uh, at the same time, you can go ahead and do that at environmentamericas.org. And we just dropped those links in the chat for you as well. So now we have our first supervisor, Angela uh, Jarding, uh, wildlife biologist at Wind Cave National Park. Share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm happy to talk about my position at Wind Cave and I'm grateful to have opportunities to pass on the experiences and how I became a wildlife biologist. Wow, where's it going? <laughs> um, and so it's a way for me to help out um, the next generation of leaders and, and I hope that it inspires you to explore the national parks through the Mosaics and Science Internship. Um, as I mentioned, and probably you saw from the posting that I'm the wildlife biologist for Wind Cave National Park. Um, I received, I grew up in a small town in Northeast Nebraska, only 250 people. And I went to school uh, for my bachelor's and master's at Brookings, South Dakota with South Dakota State University. Um, and through there, I was able to work for different graduate students, uh, master's and PhD, and I worked um, you can see the divisions of Eastern Minnesota to Western South Dakota to Yellowstone. Um, and a few of those projects I was working on mortality um, for fawns um, in Eastern Minnesota. And then that helped me get experience to work for Badlands National Park on their Swift Fox reintroduction project. And then also Yellowstone uh, National Park on their wolf project. And so um, after my bachelor's, I went and received my master's through South Dakota State working on an elk project in the Black Hills. And I became um, permanent through the National Park Service Inventory and Monitoring Network. Um, so through the Northern Great Plains there in the Central Division. Um, and I worked there as a data scientist and GIS manager. Um, and through that agency or the network, um, we handled a lot of data from plant community monitoring, bat monitoring, exotic plant management, land bird monitoring. Um, and water quality. So there's lots of different opportunities um, throughout the National Park Service. So currently where I am today, um, I am the wildlife biologist for Wind Cave. And um, 
Some of you may not know that there's actually two parks in one here where we, are, uh, we have a very large cave below ground and we also have our natural resources above ground. Um, we're about a 30,000 acre park. Um, so we're not really large, but we have a lot of, of wildlife resources. And so uh, the mission of the National Park Service is to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources for this and future generations. Um, and so that's my position is to uh, conserve those natural resources um, and make sure that we're managing the populations that are to be sustainable for future um, visitors to see. And so my job is um, I manage the bison population, elk. Uh, we have endangered black-footed ferrets. We have prairie dogs, the black-tailed prairie dog. And we also do research with bats because of uh, white nose syndrome. So I'll just talk a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm probably a little biased, but I'd say I probably have one of the best jobs in the National Park Service, getting to work with all of these uh, unique animals. Um, my position, uh, there's always a different thing to do um, throughout the year. And uh, I think last, your last uh, session, I, you had my intern um, on and uh, she was able to, she not only did her camera trap surveys, but she was able to experience all of these other projects that we had going on. So that's a really unique opportunity. Um, so as I mentioned, we do black-footed ferret research. Um, black-footed ferrets are the most endangered mammal in North America. Um, mostly due to prairie dog um, populations that have declined. Uh, only 2% of the population survives throughout America. So we do monitoring and survival um, and reproduction. So we're doing surveys in the fall and uh, we're capturing them and giving them plague vaccines. Uh, plague is a, a bubonic plague. Um, it can um, decimate prairie dog and ferret populations. And so we're actively managing for plague and make sure our populations um, remain stable. We also do um, elk research. Unfortunately, we have what is called chronic wasting disease, um, which is a degenerative brain disease that is affecting a lot of uh, deer family, um, like your deer, your mule deer, your whitetail, and your elk populations throughout the United States. Um, so we have a long program of doing elk, uh, chronic wasting disease research. Um, here's a picture of us doing some camera trap surveys. Um, we're looking at uh, reproduction. So how many calves are there to cows? Uh, we monitor for mortality. Um, and then our uh, technicians go out and get total counts of the herd throughout the year. Other work we're working on is um, in starting next spring, we'll be capturing bats. Um, focusing in on northern long-eared bats and um, determining where their maternity roosts are. So they roost in trees. And so we want to figure out um, how to protect those areas um, because northern long-eared bats um, have been greatly affected from white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that is killing um, many bats throughout the United States. And then um, we also have um, a bison herd here at Wind Cave. It's one of the most genetically diverse herds uh, in the National Park Service. Um, and, and fortunately, there is no diseases. They're a healthy herd, but that means that they reproduce really well. And so we do have bison roundups um, every other year. And so we are removing some of those bison and um, distributing them to um, nonprofit organizations and tribal agencies. So as I mentioned, um, I had a MIS intern here last year and it's a really great way for um, to gain experience with um, government agencies. And then once you get that experience, you can apply for um, our seasonal job postings or permanent positions um, through USA Jobs. Um, and they also have what's called the Land Management Workforce Flexibility Act. And so if you work for the Park Service for 24 months, um, you can begin to compete um, kind of on the internal side of the National Park Service, so not just open competitive. Um, so there's great ways to advance um, through getting experience through this internship. And then I just wanted to mention that um, when Cape National Park, there's many different divisions within our park. So we have a chief of resources um, and the superintendent is basically the leader of the park. Um, 
but they basically often come from uh, chief of resources or interpositions or law enforcement or business administration. So you can um, have different degrees and still be able to become a superintendent. Um, as I mentioned, we also have the chief of resources, um, which is my supervisor and there's three positions under him, uh, the biologist and the ecologist that does um, the plant research monitoring and then our physical scientist who does all the cave research. Um, and then our chief of interpretation is um, manages like our education specialists and our park guides who are the the people who are um, park guides or park rangers that um, promote the parks to the visitors and do the education um, about our park. And then chief of maintenance um, also handles all of the the difficult work behind the scenes that hires welders and electricians and construction personnel. And then I did just want to mention also that the Park Service has many other divisions. Um, and so I just listed a few here. Um, but you don't have to be a biologist to work for the National Park Service. You could, if you're interested in geology or water quality, um, have environmental science degrees, there's a lot of different opportunities um, to be found here at the National Park Service. And that is all I have. Thank you, Angela. And next we have uh, Gibran Nule Hurtado, community planner with Rivers, Trails and Conservation Assistance. Hi, everyone. My connection's been a little, okay, so let me know if um, I break up at any point and I'll uh, try to turn my video off. Let me share my screen. All right, so um, I'll also share a little bit about my path into the National Park Service. And I do wanna say that it's an honor to be able to speak with you all today and present, especially because I started off as an LHIP intern in 2015. I had just completed a master's at UT Austin in community and regional planning. And I did quite a bit of historic preservation work for that internship, including my thesis. So I ended up taking an LHIP position in Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is in Northern Louisiana. And the National Park Service has a, the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training there which is this really cool research and education arm of the Park Service that focuses exclusively on historic preservation and interpretation and restoration. So I was able to do a lot of really cool projects through them, even though it was a pretty short internship, um, it was really rigorous and condensed. So I was able to look at many of the historic sites in Northern Louisiana, as well as Mississippi, and then do a lot of um, rehab research throughout America for that internship. Um, and then I actually got to work with a little bit of um, the back end of the LHIP internship and mosaics and science. So I worked for Susan um, at Environment for the Americas in Bold and got to interview interns, um, set up um, webinars like the one we're on today and all that fun stuff. So I got to see that side as well. And then later on when I joined the Park Service as a supervisor, I, I've supervised um, two or yeah, it'll be two LHIP interns this coming session. So, so I've seen sort of the three sides of LHIP which has been a real privilege. Um, so then after I completed my LHIP internship in 2015, like I said, I worked for Environment for the Americas, and then I actually went back to grad school because I've always been really interested in education as well. I used to be a school teacher. So um, my second master's is in bilingual education, um, and I got to do some um, field work in Brazil um, and work with um, lower income communities in the favelas um, in English language schools. And that was really interesting. So that got me interested again in working with communities and specifically working with um, recreation and conservation programs with those communities because they often do have limited access to outdoor recreation and um, conservation areas. Um, so when I got back to the States, 
I, I saw a job hosting for River Hills and Conservation Assistance Program, which is a branch of the National Park Service that works outside of the National Park System with communities um, specifically to create recreation and conservation plans. So it was right up my alley. And, and I've been here since, um, that was about 2017. So I've been um, in, in my office, um, RTCA Austin for about three years now. It'll be four years, I guess now. And a little bit more about what the office does. So the Rivers, Trails and Conservation Assistance Programs, like I was saying, works outside of the national park system. And we develop recreation and conservation projects um, and implementation strategies, funding strategies uh, for communities that maybe don't have that expertise. Maybe they don't have a parks department or a grant writer. Uh, we'll come in and we'll develop the plan and we'll help them find funding sources for implementation as well. So it's a really neat program, especially if you do like doing um, a lot of community activism or community work or community organizing, um, anything community focused, um, you'll really find this is a pretty good niche for it. We have about 50 staff members nationwide and up to 25 interns and fellows per year. And our staff is broken up into state field offices. So usually we'll have two to three people uh, per state field office but not every state has an office. So um, my office is in Austin. We, um, there's three of us and we also cover Oklahoma because we don't have a state field office in Oklahoma. And another note on the internships, usually like Angela was saying, we try to do it so that there is a way to get your foot over and move into a permanent position through those internships. So we'll usually, host them as either DHA or PLC eligible positions. And DHA is direct hire authority, which enables you to get hired directly um, into an open position in the park service. And PLC is similar. It's still a competitive process. So you still have to interview for it. Uh, but once you meet those requirements, it makes it a lot easier to move into a permanent position with the Department of Interior. And a few project examples to kind of explain what we do a little bit further. Um, down in Corpus Christi, I worked on the North Beach Eco Park for about two years. And it's this really neat wetlands park. It's about 30 acres uh, that the city of Corpus Christi owns. And it's right along a beach. It's near the State Aquarium and the USS Lexington, which is a decommissioned war bus vessel. And they've, they've got these really amazing um, shorebird feeding grounds. Um, they've got a lot of endemic um, crustaceans and um, fish species, um, but they didn't have a conservation plan for it. And they wanted to take advantage of um, this really neat place in North Corpus Christi to make it accessible to um, students and visitors alike um, who want to learn about the environment because there isn't really a, an, what they're terming an eco park or an educational in that area of the city. Most of it's concentrated in the South where um, there are more um, resources to make that happen. So that was a really cool planning process. We did a lot of community workshops. Uh, we collaborated with landscape architects and we have what we call charrettes, which is where you bring community members in, um, you bring experts in and everyone kind of sits around a table and chats about what they want to see in this area. And then we develop a plan based on those conversations and those um, little maps that we drew out during the charrette. Um, so that project has now um, turned into a master plan for the area and the city is going to fund part of it and we're seeking funding for the other parts, but it's really neat to already see it being implemented in, in such a short term. And a similar project we had in Austin is the Williamson Creek Greenbelt Plan. So this is an area of Austin that floods frequently, and the city actually had to buy out a lot of the properties along it because the flood risk was so great. So because there were so many bought out properties that have since been demolished, there's been a lot of green space opened up along the creek corridor. And the neighbors want to see it developed into a trail system like other um, creeks and creek trails in Austin. So uh, we were able to do something similar. And because of COVID, we couldn't really have a charrette or go door to door or have public meetings the way we usually have them. Uh, so we had to be a little bit more innovative 
and do and do community mapping uh, through different platforms like Google Maps and Social Pinpoint. And folks were able to kind of drop pins where they wanted to see trails or where there were issues or where they wanted to see little pocket parks and such. And it was really neat. Um, and then we had a contractor kind of take all that info and put it together into a neat master plan. So that was um, a, a really wide collaboration. There's a lot of um, capacity here in Austin. So we were able to work with a lot of nonprofits as well as for-profit planning firms to get that done really quickly. And a little bit about past internships that we've held out of my office. So I had a community planning fellow in 2020 and that was a little bit of a longer position. It was a nine month position. Um, and she had a planning background, community planning and environmental planning background. So she was able to really jump in on a lot of our projects, which is something we encourage our interns to do. Uh, like she helped develop this little um, plan here that you see for the North Beach Eco Park. Um, and then she was able to pursue a lot of her own interests. So she was in um, leading walks through um, some project areas like uh, Williamson Creek and North Beach Eco Park. And because she had that environmental planning background, she knew a lot of the species and was able to do sort of a, a natural, where she would talk about the species um, and the importance of preserving the environment, um, specifically with um, younger kids, which is the age group she had worked the most with. And then this past summer, we had two interns, one through the Latino Heritage Internship Program and one through a local program called Texas Conservation Corps here in Austin. Uh, but we were able to have them work together, which was really neat because they were actually both of indigenous origin and they worked to put this indigenous outreach strategy together that outlines how RTCA can better serve communities in tribal lands, reservations, and indigenous communities, um, specifically in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Colorado. And that's, that's been really successful and it's been really well received. Um, I think one of the things that we've really emphasized in our region and in our program, RTCA specifically, is serving a broader community and making sure we serve a diverse community because in the past, we haven't had as many applications from, Black communities, Latino communities, and indigenous communities. Um, so we're really trying to develop outreach strategies and collaboration plans to make sure that these communities know that our services are available and to stir up projects to make sure that they also have equitable access to outdoor recreation and conservation. And it's coming here, um, our Latino Heritage Internship uh, position will focus on something similar uh, with Latino communities specifically. So that'll be a really neat opportunity. Here's just my contact info in case you have any questions that aren't answered on this webinar, or if you want to know more about my office or upcoming positions. Thank you. Thanks, Jabron. <clears throat> and now we have uh, Tani Myers, a law enforcement officer at Uinta Wasatch Catch. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, I apologize. I thought this meeting wasn't until one, so I'm actually driving home from feeding cows. But um, I am very lucky. I started out um, my history with the Forest Service. It used to be called a Student Career Experience Program, and that's how I started my time with the Forest Service back in 2004. And the program back then was you did two summers um, working with and writing with a law enforcement officer. So that is, I had worked for the Forest Service, but that's kind of how I got into law enforcement. And as long as you completed those summers successfully and graduated with your degree, then they would convert you. Uh, this new program is a little different. Um, one of the more difficult things I think is that they're having us do it during the winter, which is a little slower for the Forest Service, but it's really worked out this year. Um, but that is how I got my career started. And honestly, I don't think I would have been able to get into law enforcement had it not um, been for that. Even just getting hired for the Forest Service, there's so many job applicants and people putting in for the jobs that it makes it hard for just a regular 
student who doesn't have, say, military preference to get in with the Forest Service. Um, so this program is kind of a way to hire people who are a little underrepresented, especially in law enforcement. And it was one of the best things I had ever done. I had never considered a job in law enforcement. I was actually going to, I was doing my pre-law and was going to go to law school when I kind of got asked to join this program. And I said, I have never wanted to be a cop. That was never anything I wanted to do. And the guy said, hey, just, you love to be in the mountains. You love to be outdoors. I already know this about you. Why don't you just come try it for a summer? And if you hate it, you're out nothing. And I kind of thought about it and I was like, well, I guess he does have a point. I have a job for the summer. And if I hate it, I just go to law school. And now that was in 2004. Here we sit now. Um, I completed my two summers in Stanley, Idaho, which is a very remote place in Idaho and then was um, converted to the LEO there. I worked in Idaho for two years after that, then transferred down to um, the Heber Ranger District outside of Heber City, Utah. I worked there for about six and a half years and then transferred over to um, the Ogden Ranger District here on the UNO Wasatch Cache. And uh, lucky enough was able to get that job. It's um, basically my home base where I grew up and I've been working there ever since. Um, I have since then, I'm a field training officer with the Forest Service, so I train the new recruits fresh out of the academy. And then I had a uh, student under the SCEP program with me for two summers, and now I'm hosting um, Lonnie. So this is not my first time doing it. And I do feel like it's a really great program to help um, people decide, is this a career I wanna do? because not everyone likes to be out in the mountains and the job that we do, we are by ourselves, um, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And some, some people aren't cool with that. And uh, like Lonnie, one of the first days he was with me, we were out checking a hunting camp. And when we walked in, the people had some issues they were doing, they were shooting towards a roadway. And so I started talking to him, dealt with that and then went and checked their deer. And he's like, oh man, I was so scared. There was guns everywhere. And, and he's like, and, and our backup's like 45 minutes away. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how this job is. So that's one of the things I think is a great tool of this program is getting, getting these people out there to see if this is something they really want to do. And then not only that, um, like my intern has had a chance to go through our, um, it's called our force protection officer program where they learn how to write tickets and incident reports. And so um, he's actually had the opportunity. We won't, our agency doesn't want him to write tickets until he's fully uh, uh, employed by the Forest Service, but they're letting him write incident reports. So when we find trash or, you know, a sign that's been graffitied, he can actually do an incident report. And so um, I do have full faith that he will be converted. And uh, we use it as kind of a direct hire authority. So as long as he completes it and wants to come work for us and we have no issues with him, um, we convert him. So um, he, he'll, I think we're trying to pick a date for him to attend the academy and stuff, but he will have a huge head start on knowing how to fill out tickets, how to fill out incident reports, knowing um, the code of federal regulations that we use, uh, knowing different locations and um, We've had him go around and luckily where I am, it's a fairly urban forest and there's a lot of officers nearby. So he's been able to not only experience um, the Ogden Ranger District, he's got to go work into Idaho. Um, he's got to go work into Wyoming. Actually right now, he got to go on a detail down to Las Vegas, a Christmas detail, <laughs> which I've never been to, but I've heard is pure craziness. So we're trying to get him out on a few different things and he's getting to see everything that the forest service has to offer and um like for him he had never seen snow before so uh one of the first days that it snowed here he just got out of the truck and threw snow in the air on himself and um i, I know he's had a couple times where he's been super nervous because he had never really been in steep mountains and it's some pretty rugged terrain out here so a couple of the roads i took him up he was you know grabbing the uh oh crap bar as they call it and like, man, this is super steep, but he has done everything I've asked him to like a champ. We had him go out one day and help let, uh, put cement on fire rings 
he's learned how to check Christmas tree tags, uh, firewood tags, just so many things that he never even knew the Forest Service did. So this program is honestly an amazing tool, especially if you have someone that's like, man, I think I like being outdoors and I'd really love a career working in the mountains. It's such a good tool to get them out there and let them see if this job really is something they like and kind of let them know what happens in the forest. You know, we, we check four wheeler registrations, we do search and rescues, we deal with a lot of uh, homeless issues, stuff that I think most people in the public don't really realize that we deal with. And so um, it's been a great program for us. Environment for America's has been great to work with. Um, the only hiccup I've even seen at all is uh, the scheduling because they want them to only work 80 hours and we sometimes work a lot more than that. But we're working through that and I think we've reached a pretty good solution to keep both of us happy with how that's going. Um, approving the timesheets and everything has gone great. I, this has been this, oh, even smoother than the program the Forest Service used to do themselves. And the Environment for American Peoples have been great for us to work with, helping us get Lonnie's travel scheduled and everything else went really, really smooth, which I was super nervous on that because he doesn't have a travel card yet. And, um, you know, just a lot of little things that you don't think about. So um, I have enjoyed uh, having my intern here with me and how the program has went and it's a real benefit to the forest service to be able to hire an employee who already knows what they're doing and is able to hit the ground running as soon as they graduate the academy so um, it's been when it works out and we find the right fit it's great but if it's not a good fit hopefully we find that out before we waste money sending someone to the academy that's going to hate being in the mountains or not like being in some of the remote Forest Service is located in. So, um, anything else, Andrea? Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Tani, and for your kind words. Um, so, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. If anybody wants to go ahead and, and put their questions in the chat or raise your hand, and you can go ahead and ask them that way. It could be for the supervisors, um, or if you have any questions on the programs, anything, uh, please feel free to do that. Before we do that, Andrea, I'm going to take us off live stream so everybody feels comfortable turning on their cameras. So I'm going to ask everyone to just hold tight for 10 seconds while we stop the live stream. We currently don't have any questions in the chat box yet, Andrea. So I think I think um, people are waiting for a chance to just raise their hand and ask the supervisor themselves. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, we have uh, Mika in the chat. If you fill out one application, uh, say the EFTA, does that apply to all the programs? I can go ahead and, and take that one if you'd like, Andrea. So when you apply for a specific internship or position, Dur uh, towards the end of the application, and we'll ask you to pick your first, second, and third choices. Um, your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice can come from all different programs. Um, a couple from one program, maybe one from another one that interests you. You can mix and match as much as you'd like, and the respective program managers will see that uh, when your application is submitted. Yes, and thank you. And I'll just add to that. So, like I said, when we uh, on that last slide with all of the links. So if you want to, if you're only interested in the mosaics program, you know, you only want positions for mosaics, you can go onto the mosaics uh, page and do it there. And then you can, you know, put your first choice, your second choice and your third choice. We're going to respect your first choice. So we we're going to try to, to get you uh, for that first position. If you want just the Latino heritage internship program, you can go onto the Latino Heritage uh, website and go ahead and fill it out there. And again, you're gonna have choice one, choice two, choice three. And if you want to go ahead and, and like Alberto said, if you wanna go ahead and choose from different programs, you can do that on the Environment for the Americas uh, website. And then you'll be able to choose from different programs. Again, uh, choice one, choice two, choice three. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, we have Faith. 
Um, in terms of scheduling, most positions I've found start in mid-May, but I am in school until mid-June. Is there any flexibility with scheduling for internships? And actually, Angela can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, there is flexibility. Um, depending on uh, who you're working for, when the seasonal job, um, when they're needed for the job duties, but there's like, my intern Brooke Sue started in July and we were able to work with her, you know, when she was able to come on. So uh, that, that definitely works with us. Yes, and thank you for doing that. <laughs> so yes, flexibility for start dates and end dates. Um, you just have to uh, complete the 12 weeks. So in Brooke's case, because she started in July, when she presented at the careers workshop that we do for interns, she presented what she was going to do at the park and she was very well, she was into her second or third week by then. <laughs> So she knew exactly what she was doing. She presented that she didn't have results by the time that she was presenting, but she definitely has results now. And she did present to the park uh, staff and administration and it went great that Tuesday. I was so excited. Yeah, it was great. Any other questions? No, we still got some time. So if anybody thinks of anything, so you can put it in the chat, you can go ahead and raise your hand. If you think of something later, uh, maybe we're, we're already done and you think of something, uh, we'll go ahead and put some emails in the chat so that you can go ahead and email us. I would like um, if Hibran can, um, oh, the housing, Andrea. But Hibran, this is one for, for, for El Tintero. <laughs> so, uh, uh, both Tawny and Angela have positions in the field and, and Jibran's position is in the office. So maybe talk about what you're looking for in an intern, Jibran, because it's obvious for the field positions, maybe not that obvious for the positions that you have at the office. So after, I can just, Andrea, if I can just intervene with the housing. Yes, internships do include housing. If the park has housing, you will be placed in the housing. But if not, then we you will be placed outside, but at the cost of the pro, the program will cover the cost. So if Hibran can 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 answer, um, what are the characteristics that you're looking for in an intern for your program? Yeah, thanks, Shelda. We've actually been fairly flexible in the past. So we'll usually announce it as an outreach position. So anyone that has um, any background doing sort of um, canvassing or reaching out to different folks, it, do, even marketing um, and is outgoing and wants to work with communities is eligible. And then if you have a degree in something like planning or community work or um, um, even like Latin American studies, it's really broad. It's kind of like, as long as you're willing to do the outreach work and you're comfortable um, reaching out to dozens of new contacts that you'll probably meet over the summer, um, then we'll take that sort of eagerness and positivity and we'll take that into account probably more so than um, specific degree programs. But if, if your goal is to work for RTCA long-term, I will say um, masters in either community planning or environmental science or outdoor recreation is what we look for for permanent positions. Awesome, thank you. We have a question here from Alexander. Would you recommend these internships for people interested in research careers? Yes, so like Tani said, and hers was specific to law enforcement, but uh, the resource assistant program also has you know, various fields uh, Latino Heritage Internship Program has various fields. So does Mosaics and Science, uh, even though Mosaics and Science does concentrate more on science, but you know you can do research in, in any field. And I think what Tani said is really important. It gives you a chance to see, you know, you know, this is these some of these are summer internships, some of these are, are longer internships, but they're internships that you're supposed to learn and you have a chance to see, you know, what is it that you're getting yourself into? Do you really like this? Is this the area that you want to pursue? Um, so I do think that that is really helpful. And also a lot of people that are, um, that are thinking about grad school, they sometimes need a little bit more field work. 
And so these uh, can really provide that opportunity for field work. And Angela also had experience this past summer with her intern wants to continue into research. Maybe you can mention something about what Brooke was interested in. Yeah, and for Brooke, um, it, because you know she's coming into the, the science side and natural resources and she had an environmental science major, um, we definitely um, developed that project so that she could do it in a research-based format. Um, and that's, um, I think that's, MIS is great to get research experience um, for research careers. Um, USGS is part of the, the Department of Interior and that's kind of our PhD level researchers, but even the National Park Service has what we also call, you know, data scientists and, and I'm a part of, of research and, an, and analyzing data. Thanks. Any other questions? Andrea, thank you for, for providing this broad uh, holistic view of intern supervisors because Angela isn't in, into the field research and he ran is into the, the community outreach and Tani and law enforcement. And we did hear from, uh, we, we do have the supervisors from the interns that presented last week. So Lonnie is under Tani and Brooke was under Angela. So we heard their side last week and how they grew so much over the, their experience. So that is, that is uh, thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Debron, Angela, Tani, thank you so much for, uh, for everything that you've said today and for all of your mentoring. Andrea, we have a request in the chat. Uh, Angela, could you please talk more about your experiences with the inventory and monitoring program? Sure. Um, so there are 32 networks um, distributed throughout the United States. Um, I started as a data manager GIS um, technician. And I worked there seasonally for three years. Uh, and then I became uh, permanent as the assistant data manager. Um, and so the, the networks um, were developed in the 90s um, to kind of cover the research and monitoring that um, the parks couldn't do themselves. And so it's more of the higher level research of the, like the plant community monitoring. And um, I'll get back to that. But so the networks, like there's 13 parks in, in within the Northern Great Plains network, and, and there's a certain amount of parks in other networks. Um, and so, as I mentioned, they do monitoring like plant community monitoring. Um, so like diversity of plants within your park, exotic species, um, water quality monitoring. Um, some land bird research that um, through the network, we actually contract through Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, so those are the top three priority research projects that um, the parks wanted throughout the network, through our network. Um, but their positions are usually posted on USA Jobs as well. Um, and then uh, I became the data manager, um, which was basically the data scientist, which was handling all the research that was um, happening at our network and making sure we made the data available for the public and um, the, the researchers, the ecologists were publishing their data um, and we kind of were the data warehouse people. Um, and I think of any other questions, keep, keep coming. Still have a few minutes if anyone has any other questions. Yes. What's the animal behind you, Angela? Uh -huh. That is the black footed ferret. We did some um, camera trap surveys out on our prairie dog towns, and we got one on camera, which is not easy to do, actually. <laughs> so we were excited. They are, they're very cute. Okay, well, thank you everybody for being here today. Our uh, next session will be in January. So that will be January 18th and it'll be a day in the life of an environment for the Americas intern.
We have one more question I think we can squeeze in here. Uh, we got Sherman asking, what are some of the biggest challenges for people new to outdoor field work? You want me to take that? Connie available for that one? She was talking about Lonnie, yeah. Yes, I am available. So, well, if you can imagine coming from Florida where it's like 85 degrees, to coming to Utah where there's snow on the ground and you've never been in that. Well, I think our biggest challenge with Lonnie has been keeping him warm. Uh, and we ordered, <laughs> luckily our agents was really great to order him some really good high quality snow gear. So he's been able to stay a little warmer yet uh, since then. But um, the other thing is I think just getting used to the remoteness of it. Having come from a big city, it was funny. I had, I was arranged housing for him but I thought it was some pretty great housing in a pretty good location compared to some of this other stuff I'd seen in the Forest Service. And he's like, oh my gosh, this is so remote. So getting used to living away from a big city in a smaller place, and he's used to it now and he's okay with it. Um, but I would say that some of the biggest challenge is the temperature differences. And then also uh, just the cultural differences of being out in the woods, never having been, you know, in a way he had been in like the foresty areas before, but this is totally different out here. And being, um, you know, 20 minutes from Ogden, which is not a huge city, but a pretty big city. And, and honestly, he's in one of the least remote areas we have in our region. So uh, some of the other people in some of the more remote areas that are happening to stay like in a camp trailer or different things like that, I think those are some of the biggest challenges and not being able to do like the social life that they would do in a college town because a lot of our areas aren't that big for those kind of things. So those have been, I think, Lonnie's two biggest things. Thanks, Tony. Angela, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say, it, um, if you're new to field work, it can be a little bit intimidating um, if you're not used to navigating using maps. Um, uh, or, and as Tawny said, being by yourself. Um, but uh, here at Parks, you know, we give training and if you're not comfortable doing something, you say, you know, just say say something. Um, we took Brooke out the, the first week. You know, anytime you're to a new environment, it's, it's intimidating. And um, so I hiked with her the first couple of weeks and showing her the sites and the parks and teaching her how to do navigation, which um, with iPads and technology, most all students are very tech savvy these days. So um, in the old days of reading topographic maps doesn't really happen anymore <laughs> with geolocation. Um, so that definitely helps being in the outdoors. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's just, you know, getting used to your surroundings and, and it's fine to be nervous at first. Um, we also, you know, train on bison. Um, bison can be dangerous. So teaching, making people aware of your surroundings and what is dangerous and what are the behaviors to look out for. Um, so yeah, getting used to those, those new, new animals. Thanks, Angela. All right, well, we hope to see you all in January and we hope to see your applications start coming in and happy holidays, everyone. Thank, Thank you all. I think it's safe now. We're all done. Ah, one more. Okay, we now go. we are. <laughs> oh, that one great, Andrea. Really did. Oh my God, I was <laughs> freaking out at the beginning. I was like, where <laughs> are <laughs> they? <laughs> and then I still were. mispronounced Angela's last name after she just told me how to say it. Sorry, it doesn't matter. It's okay. We did good. And right. um, yeah, I think... I think we only had two supervisors in last year because they didn't take up all that time. And, and, and then the questions started and once they started, they just kept, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I so, remember you saying that. So you, I'm, you I'm know, glad the timing great. worked out. <laughs> Thank did. you. It Thank did. you, Shayla. Thank you, Al, for helping. <laughs> we are so ready. 
So for January, who's got that one? Um, I think it's you and uh, hold on. <laughs> I, I might be lying, but I think it's a combination of you and Chanel and then Chanel has the last one. Yeah, yeah I think that's that's how you guys had done it. So it'll be another uh, day in the 